A theologian named Augustine, or Augustine, you may have heard it both ways, uh, is one of the first to really try to set out Christian political theory. We talked before how the New Testament, there's a few passages that talk about government, but there's not a lot. And in those intervening centuries, Christians aren't really developing political theory because they have no political power. And so it's mostly trying to respond to political uh, authorities, right? The apologists like Justin, which offers me another opportunity to remind you that your papers due tomorrow. Um, that, you know, they're trying to respond. You're not trying to develop a, a theoretical model for politics. Now, Ambrose he had some ideas, wrote a little bit, but it's not as extensive as, uh, uh, as Augustine. Although Augustine, and you'll be reading Augustine as well for the next reflection paper, Augustine's main work of political theology is City of God. Essentially, Augustine looked at the world as involving two cities. There's the city of God and the earthly city. The city of God is built on the love of God. The earthly city is built on the love of self. Right? And so this contrast between, uh, you know, what, what's the foundation here? But Augustine re realized, even though he's, he's talking about, um, you know, a situation where there's a Christian emperor, that the city of God and the, the earthly city are always intermingling. As much as monastics and other people would like to separate totally from the world, it is not feasible, nor is it our call as Christians to totally separate from the world. So there's always going to be some sort of intermingling between the city of God and the earthly city. Now, the city of God is the church, right? It's not heaven, right? And so the city of God, the church is always going to be intermingled with the world. Eventually, though, only the city of God is going to remain. Human kingdoms rise and fall because they're, re they're, they're based on human inclinations, human vices, and ultimately, for Augustine, the difference between the church and the world is very obscure because they're mixed. But he ultimately feels, in the, the Roman situation, that the church should work with the empire, but that the church should be the leader. Now, part of this is, is coming out of a situation where Rome has fallen, right? So, the 400s, the 5th century. And so a lot of pagan Romans were saying, look, Rome fell to the barbarians because it became Christian. And so Augustine's also trying to say, well, no, it's not that, but it's something else. So he's trying to justify Christianity here as well. Augustine also talked about this issue that we kind of talked about earlier, coercion. What kind of power does a Christian emperor have when it comes to sinfulness and heresy. Now, ultimately, Augustine said, the, the, city, the earthly city operates under coercion. In the world, coercion exists. Now, Christians must exist in this world of, of coercion, but they should be led, right? and so kind of working against coercion. except when it comes to heretics. Coercion for Augustine may be appropriate in the context of heretics. They must be convinced of the error of their ways. And force can even be used, says Augustine. He bases this off of Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke chapter 14 is Luke's version of the wedding banquet, where somebody's holding a wedding banquet, he goes out to the people that have been invited and says, time for the banquet, but they start making all sorts of excuses, nod your head like this if you know what I'm talking about, all right? Um, and, and then the leader of the banquet says, 
uh, you know, go out into the streets, bring the poor to the lane. Well, in Luke's version, there is this verse that talks about, well, we've done that, and he says, go out and compel them to come in, right? And so in Latin, compelle entare, which Augustine took of as you can force people into the church or into orthodoxy. Human government can be used in this case. In fact, Augustine thought it was the duty of the human governor for the common good and the good of the people to coerce heretics to the true faith. Augustine is also important because he is the first one to begin to develop just war theory. Within Christianity, there has been an extensive development of just war theology. When is it righteous to go to war? What acts are righteous in war? These are the questions that Augustine is trying to answer. Because for the first time, Christians are faced with these questions. Right? You know, yes, there were some Christians in the army prior to uh, the empire becoming uh, becoming Christian, but but now there are some questions. And so, you saw Bellum, right? when is it just to go to war? You saw Bello is what actions are just in war, right? Just to war, just in war. War will not disappear, said Augustine. As Christians, we desire peace, but we consistently find struggle. Heretics, invaders, etc. Right? So we want peace, but other people do not. So when is war just, at least according to Augustine? War is just when the intent to go to war is just. And, and I think Kelly pointed that out, right? It, it kind of depends. Why are you going to war? If you're going to war to gain power, that's one thing, but if you're going to help someone else or help your people, Right? And so Augustine said, it's just when the intent is just. If you're trying to bring about peace, that would be a justful motive to go to war. If its objective is just, your, your, goal, your objective is to vindicate justice. You want justice to reign. War is just when the disposition is just. Now, this is Augustine. If you're acting out of love, now, I've never served in the military. I have grandparents that did. Uh, I have high respect for people that serve their army, uh, serve their country in the army. But that's a difficult one to say. How are you, how are you acting out of love? as a soldier. Now, certainly our soldiers do a lot of good things other than engaging in violence, right? They're out there building roads, building houses, building schools. And so, you know, there's a lot of good that our army today does. And we can kind of see how you can act out of love in certain situations. But we're talking ancient Rome, right? When they didn't do that thing, right? You go through, you burn everything down, and you salt the earth so everything can't, nothing can come back. How's that acting out a lot? Right. And so, you know, we can say, well, huh. And Augustine kind of recognized that. And so he made a distinction between the inward dis disposition of, you know, I, maybe it could be I love my people, or I, I love righteousness, versus your outward actions, which may not appear loving, but could still be done from a motive of love. Ultimately, war is also just when its order or auspices are just, right? When, the, when a rightly ordained ruler calls for the war. And Augustine felt, even if a pagan ruler, right, there's a pagan in charge, and you're a Christian soldier, if he is the appropriate ruler and he orders you to war, you follow his orders, even though he's a pagan. And so Christian soldiers should even obey pagan rules. What matters is, were they rightly ordained? 
right? If this isn't somebody that's revolted, this isn't somebody that, you know, uh, was a coup. And in war, a soldier's actions should always be just, said Augustine. They should not engage in extreme violence. They should not participate in atrocities or ambushes and should not be involved in massacres. But ultimately, and this probably makes sense, that Augustine felt a war can be just on one side only. Both sides could not honestly, truthfully, be engaged in a just war from each side. Now they might think it's from a just war side, but only one side can be just in such a war. Eventually, Christians will take a lot of Augustine's thought and, and develop codes of war, right? Um, you know, what, what roles do each people have in a society like that? Uh, so, for example, a private citizen should only wield the sword at the direction of the magistrate or the official. Uh, a minister or a priest should not wield the sword because of their responsibilities. Monks should not be involved in war because they're dedicated to seeking perfection. Questions about political theology or just war theory. These ideas will continue to develop throughout Christianity, but Augustine kind of serves as the, the foundation. And we'll see some of this as we go throughout other places. As we move in today, and, and, and we're getting close to the end of class today, um, we're moving into doctrine now. And one of the biggest issues, doctrinally, in the fourth century, was the question of who Jesus was. Specifically related to, you know, his identity, his nature. So, let's think a little bit. What does scripture say about Jesus' nature? He's of God. Okay, so there's, the, there's passages that talk about Jesus coming from God, being uh, the Son of God. There are other passages that indicate divinity. What else does Scripture say about Jesus' nature? All right, perfect. What else? All right, there's, there's that aspect of he's both divine, but he's also a human. So, how is Jesus, how is it possible for Jesus to be both God and human? What scripture can we point to that will help us understand this? I mean, when we think about it, when we say Jesus is God, what are some of the things we mean by that? Did you point to like First Corinthians fourteen that talks about the resurrection body? Okay, well, I mean, there's there's definitely some things about you know the the physicality of Jesus' resurrection that's emphasized in First Corinthians. John one. John one talks about him being God, and then verse fourteen says he became flesh and dwelt among us. But when we say Jesus is God, what does that mean? What do we what do we mean by that? Okay, he's one part of the Trinity, right? The three persons of the Godhead. We'll get into right, how do they relate? <laughs> how can God be both three and one? Alright? What does that mean? To say he's part of the Trinity. To say he's God. What does it mean to be God? I think it's really nice that like First Corinthians 14, you know, that's not specifically talking about the resurrection body, but the concept is it is a literal being body that is 
uh, exponentially beyond our understanding. Okay. So it's like, in the sense, how we understand it, we don't see it as being physically and completely great and awesome because it adds, it adds a tangibleness to it. That's not like a ghost, um, but it's something so much greater than what we understand. Okay. And so I think if you were to kind of expound more on that principle of like a scripture like that, you can help see, okay, this is kind of what God is as far as a literal tangible being. Okay. As Jesus always had that physical body. Physical or like? Yeah. Did, did he always have did he always have a physical body? Well, no okay, so what does it mean to say Jesus is God? Well, part of it is there's a pre existence before he becomes Jesus. I mean John refers to him as the Word. What does that mean? About prior to his, prior to the existence of Jesus of Nazareth, what are the characteristics of the second person of the Godhead? Or the second person of the Trinity? I think we would ask the same thing about God the Father. Okay. Okay. So God of God. Part of God and the community of God. Okay. Now we're, we're kind of trying to figure out the, the Trinity. Let's hold that one off for a later class. But what does it mean to be God? What are, what are the characteristics of God? Divine, all-powerful. Divine, all-powerful, authority, all-knowing, all right, all-present. Yeah. That second person of the Godhead, second person of the Trinity, became human. In becoming Jesus of Nazareth, can he be all present? I think God the Father can have the side of that. But I don't know the scriptural basis to back that up, so I'm not going to Well, he was all knowing. Um, and there's an artist. Yeah. 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 Peter was going to deny that he was going to betray him. So I would say that um, not that I'm 100% sure, but I would say that the attributes that he had as a heavenly being, he also had as a heavenly being. Did he? I don't know that for sure. I didn't Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to get Matthew chapter 24 around verse. 36. Yes, please. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Was Jesus all knowing in his human form? Not perhaps all knowing in every, everything that was to come. Right, so, I mean, he, he knew some things, right? Because there's passages that talk about he knew what they were thinking, he knew the hearts of men, right? But this passage tells us Jesus is speaking here, right? And so we believe that he's uninspired. We believe this is a record of what Jesus says. Jesus says, I don't know the day or the hour. Well, so does that mean that Jesus was not good because he said, I'm not good at the problem? He might well have said, I'm not good at the I mean, that might have been a rhetorical point, but as a human being, can you be all present? What does is, what is being all present or omnipresent mean? Being all places at one time. Can you, can you be, <laughs> yes. As a physical human, right? can you be all places at one time? So, he has all the qualities of God before becoming human, but when he's on earth, he's limited, right? I think through his own choice, through the actions of God the Father, but there's limits because of being human. Now, if he's not all-knowing, what are some explanations for why he could not be all-knowing? Okay. We have this very 
ethereal thing known as the, the physical brain and the soul and the mind. We might call it mind and the brain. Right? And so we have this physical brain and then this mind. And somehow this physical brain and this mind are connected and operate together. And normally that's fine for us. But did Jesus have a divine mind? Prior to his existence as Jesus of Nazareth, did the, did the Word have a divine mind? I would say yes. Yes. Easy question, yes. Does Jesus of Nazareth have a divine mind? Does he have a human mind? Yes. Does he have two minds? Could he have a, a limited divine mind? I think I don't have Revelation telling from God, I come up on earlier, that there's some things that God has revealed to Jesus in the flesh, human mind, that makes him confident that he is the Son of God. That makes him confident in the fact that he is who he's going to claim to be and who people claim him to be. I think God can do the same comfort in that. Okay. And then it's back to the Holy Trinity, but I think that's wrapped up in it. I'm trying not to get like sidetracked on that, but um, in Hebrews 2, in verse 17, it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest service of God and make the situation to the to the people. Because he himself was suffering with sentences, he is able to help us with sentences. And that's kind of that division between him and God the Father, where God the Father is the righteous judge because he was made fully human, which I think part of that is a lessening of that divine nature. That's why he's merciful and he's our grateful life because he understands. And so there has to be that separation between the divine nature. So Another one to think about as we close. Last thing. What's the nature of God? He's not physical, so he's spirit. Right? God is his spirit. Right? John chapter 4. So that meant the pre existent word was a spirit. Now, did that pre existent word spirit unite with the physical body of Jesus in Adam? Yeah, it's got to in order to be some continuity. But based on that passage that Trish just read, did Jesus also have a human spirit? Right. This rather complicated discussion helps us prepare for thinking of the question of Jesus, because now that there is a persecution, now that you're not marginalized, you have the luxury of starting thinking questions like that. Right. And thinking about those kind of things. Um, you know, and, and we might say, well, it doesn't matter if God knows. And in a sense, yes, I would agree with that. But what these people that start getting into these discussions are looking for is I want to have some precision. I want to understand. And so that's what we'll look at starting on Tuesday.